Chapter 16. Technological Improvement After the President and Justinian shook on it, they spent several hours negotiating. Justinian wanted to be allowed to build an embassy here in D.C. Earth, from where his kingdom could negotiate with America. President Buren felt this was fair, as D.C. was also the site of the Hall of Justice. While the hell was a tourist spot, it was still a major league presence that would ensure safety in the off chance Justinian decided to attack the capital. Once that was agreed on, Justinian's advanced mind began to run at breakneck speed. Once the embassy was agreed on, Justinian went on to the next subject. Since you are recognizing my kingdom as a foreign state, that means we would have a currency. I have been in control only for two months, but I have prepared a currency to start trading. Buren was now interested. Do you have any to show? T do. He opened a small purple and gold portable and held his hand out to it. From the portal emerged a small leather pouch, which was made from the hide of a Martian lizard. Justinian opened the pouch and pulled out three coins. One was made of pure copper, which could be called dragon copper, as it had been melted in dragon fire. Next to it, he placed a pure dragon steel coin, and next to that was a pure gold coin. In the future, there is no single currency as the Imperium is made up of over a million worlds. A single unified currency was impossible, but some were popular. From left to right is the credit, throne, and crown. Images here. President Buren reached out and picked up the coins. All the coins on the front were the Imperial Aquila, which the President thought was beautiful. When he flipped the credit, he saw a large skull. The skull? The skull is seen as a holy symbol in the Imperium. It shows the sacrifice the Emperor of Mankind gave for humanity, along with the billions that die every day to keep the darkness away. Buren remembered the war in the Webway video, the alien hordes, the Tyranid hives, and the Necron tomb worlds. C. He put the credit down before he picked up the steel crown. The Imperial Quilla was also on it, but on its back was a Primaris Space Marine helmet. A Primaris Space Marine, another super soldier of the Imperium. We custodies are unique, each of us, made by hand by the Emperor. The Adeptus Astartes are effectively mass-produced super soldiers. The masses call them the Angels of Death or the Emperor's Angels. Buren now had to ask something. This Emperor of Mankind sounds like a god. Justinian frowned. The imperial truth says there is no such thing. The emperor always said that reason, respect for the methodology of science, and secular progress should be what mankind strived for. However, in mankind's defense, the emperor may as well have seemed like a god to them. He tried to strive to abolish all religion because it had split mankind for too long. After his death, he could no longer do so and is now worshipped as the god emperor, an idea he abhorred. Superman and Diana looked at each other, because the more about the future they heard, they realized why Justinian wanted to prevent it. Everything was tragic, dark, or awful. Buren sighed as he placed the throne down. When he looked at the crown, he of course could tell it was gold. When he picked it up, he saw the Aquila, and when he flipped it, he saw Robout Gulliman. Robout Gilliman, the Avenging Son, the Lord of Ultramar, the Imperial Regent and Lord Commander of the Imperium, he is the thirteenth son of the Emperor of Mankind and the current head of the Imperium. For some reason, President Buren could see just how much Justinian, while he wanted to prevent its existence, felt pride in the Imperium. He put the crown coin down before he nodded. Accepting these coins as currency is more than acceptable. With this, proper trade between Mars and Earth can begin in earnest. The production of the coins was easy and annoying. He had hundreds of laborers working to melt down the metal and make the engravings. Once Justinian's currency was chosen, he went on to other things. For now, I wish to sell metals for dollars. I have several items that would be incredibly annoying to build from scratch. They would be incredibly helpful to build some factories on Mars, as the Martian people don't use technology all that much. Buren nodded. Acceptable. They will be sold at market value, and you will have the U.S. government to help in the purchase of whatever you need. However, I would also like to bring up something important. Will the United States and its allies be allowed on Mars? Justinian leaned back in his constructed chair a bit. You may go to Mars, but you cannot take land. You can have embassies, and we can trade, but taking territory on the surface or underground is a no-go. For one, 
the White Martian empires would wipe out any attempts. Mars is also going to be the seat of my empire, like Terra is the center of the Imperium. I wish for Earth and Mars to trade and be at peace, but I wish for complete Martian independence. Buren now had an issue with this. You wish to have full control of the entirety of Mars? Mars has billions of dollars worth of resources that could progress the prosperity of all mankind. Do you not wish for mankind to prosper? Justinian snorted internally, but outwardly he was stoic. T do with for mankind to prosper, but I know humanity better than anyone, since I am also human. Greed is one of the biggest segregating factors, and I do not want to use Mars for basic profit. It is a treasure trove and handing territory to others when I'm doing the terraforming, building the infrastructure, and more. I will not budge on this president. Superman nodded. Understood. Buren wanted to protest, but he relented. To see, you said terraforming? Justinian nodded. To have been working on something to give Mars a breathable atmosphere to regular humans. I can breathe perfectly fine, but at the moment Mars is a big rock with all the life happening deep underground. Having trees, grasses, oceans, and animals would be far preferable even to the Martians. Remnosh herself said as such. Agreed. We white Martians live underground, not because the surface temperature or radiation affects us, but because we prefer the more mellow temperature of the underground. If we could live in comfort on the surface, we would. Buren turned to her as she was still in her flaming armor. Your guard is a white Martian? Justinian nodded. She is. Under the surface, there is humidity, warmth, agriculture, and massive cities. However, the surface is a wasteland, which is why both must be used. I am sure we have more to talk about, as I have said everything I want. We can sign a treaty later, but for now my terms have been said. An embassy, currency agreements, trade, technology acquisition, and complete autonomy of Mars. Just as it is in the 41st millennium. President Buren thought, as there were so many things he could ask for. Several of these were military agreements, as Martians were all innately powerful. Just the small force that Justinian could wipe out a force of humans, ten times their size with a widespread psychic attack, heat vision blasts, or just up and personal. They could be used to place pressure on enemies of the state, but he kept his mouth shut. He was only not worried because he had Superman and Wonder Woman right next to him. If he had to face the pressure of being in front of Justinian alone, he may have folded as he was feeling transhuman dread. What would have been a shrewd politician was reduced to a quite agreeable toddler. However, it might just be psychic manipulation Justinian was using. Politicians, they talk big but are nothing but children. After this, Justinian and Buren spent another hour going over some more. Mostly it was Buren trying to keep up with the transhuman mind of Justinian. He could not do it at all, and in the end, America didn't win anything major. Just trade agreements that Justinian was going to begin. That would bring revenue, but not at the level that would be profitable for the nation. At the end of that hour, Justinian got everything he wanted. T believe we should pick out another better date to sign this into treaty. For now, I will be returning to Mars. Buren nodded. Of course, we should agree to a future date soon. Justinian dispelled his chair and grabbed his helmet, which was still plugged in. He removed the USB, breaking the link to his soul and giving Dedrag and Albion relief. The moment the flow of information was done, the two dragons sighed in relief. I thank you both for that. How bad was it? We had to process millions on millions of gigabytes. So much of what is on the internet is a bunch of worthless information, but we did not allow any useless information to enter your date banks. As we said before, we stored everything in chemistry, biology, physics, biochemistry, genetics, and so much more. All this information will allow you to use Earth technology as a starting point to build up to the 40K stuff. Then you can build off that. How are you guys feeling, though? Tired, but we are fine. Do not underestimate the mind or souls of a dragon, much less us. Our mental fortitude and intellect surpass humanity by far. We are heavenly dragons to boot, so while this was beyond annoying, it was not all that bad. Regardless, I am grateful. Now to return to Mars's Millies. He placed his helmet on and turned to Remnosh. Let's go. She nodded as they both phased through the wall of the White House. Once he was outside, his five honor guards surrounded him as they began to walk out. 
When he was gone, President Buren fell limp in his chair as he wiped the sweat off his face. Superman walked toward him and placed a hand on his shoulder. President, what is wrong? Tam an old man, Superman, and standing in the same room as that being was dreadful. Looking into his golden eyes was like I was being taken apart piece by piece. By the time I could think, he had already seen through it, thought around it, and thousands of times. He looks and talks like a man, but deep down I don't believe he has any humanity left. Whatever the touch of the Emperor of Mankind did to him surely didn't leave anything that can be called humanity. Diana frowned at the words, as Justinian was just as human as the President. Do not insult him. That man is just as human as you or any person out on the street. Buren was not going to argue with Diana. He was already stressed out by one demigod. He didn't want to deal with another. Rather than stick around, Superman left before Diana got angry. While Justinian and his honor guard were returning, Billy Batson, better known as Shazam, was standing in front of Grendel. The Predacon was named like that because his colors were dark green and he was the most ruthless of his brothers. His glowing eyes were squinted as he was tempted to blast Billy in Dragonfire. Billy rubbed his hands together as he was nerding out. This is so sick. Nothing is cooler than dragons, but robot dragons are even cooler. He was about to reach his hand out to try to pet Grendel, but one of Justinian's honor guards spoke up. This Martian was shapeshifted into appearing like Ulrich the Slayer of the Space Wolves, image here. His psi magic glaive was in his right hand, and without moving his head, he gave a warning. Do not touch Grendel. Hearing the warning, Billy stopped his hand. That his name? The guard did speak as each of the thirty elites stood straight. Billy started to hear the sound of several huge footsteps behind him. When he turned around, he saw Justinian and his six guards. As a custodes, Justinian weighed almost a ton outside his armor right behind him. Leave my pet alone. Billy backed away as Grendel roared in his face. Fine, dude, no need to be rude. Justinian ignored him and turned to his troops. He communicated through their psychic net. Land the President have come to some agreements. Mars is going to be completely left alone, and we will begin to trade with America. This will bring technology I can use to bring a technological awakening in our civilization. Once our fortress city is complete, we will have our capital where we can begin the unification wars. For now, we return to Mars. Justinian aimed his hand forward and tore open another golden and purple portal. Zatanna, who was nearby, could just feel the ease at which he did that. But Justinian began to lead his forces through the gate, starting with his Predacons. Just as he was about to leave, Grendel shot a snort in Shazam's face, making him glare back. Quickly enough, all the soldiers, elites, warshapers, Predacons, and Justinian had crossed through. When Justinian and his forces returned to the Martian surface, he removed his helmet before taking a deep breath of the Martian air. He kind of missed the air. We have several things to begin with. A permanent portal to send trade items and troops. Rimnosh at his left had some ideas. When the embassy is up and running, let us have a secret portal in it in case we need to send a big force quickly. That is implied. We will make America think they are our only source of trade, but it is false. As I said, we will begin to replace America's enemy leaders with infiltrators, and I will also extend an offer of trade to other countries and even build a secret base in Africa or the Middle East. I will need human bodies and more to begin my genetic experiments. Rimnosh and his honor guard began to see that Justinian was going all in. They may fear him, but a part of them as white Martians respected their warlord. They could not wait to unleash their wrath in his name, and he could not wait to start. Justian led them all back down to Nucadia as construction continued around them. The fortress was being built around the staircase, which would be upgraded into an elevator soon. Just as he was going down, he remembered all the satellites orbiting Mars. Those would have to go, but not yet. Patience would win him the day over hastiness. When they returned to the city, it was bustling with work. Any able-bodied Martian was expected to work. They were either working in the mines or the forges processing tons on tons of ore, shaping that into armor, weapons, and weapons, or planting crops. Everyone had a job, and while the white Martians had no money, this was better than being treated as nothing but a slave 
as the previous patriarch had. Anyone had potential and was treated as a valued worker. From laborer to elite, they all had their place. When they returned to the pyramid, Justinane sat himself back down on his crystal throne. Remnash did not sit on him this time, but on the armrest. She removed her helmet while the shapers returned to their duties down below. The soldiers were sent to patrol the city to make sure everything was in order. His honor guard surrounded him as usual. Justinian looked down at the city that was rapidly changing. This is just the start. Remenosh smiled as she also found her calling after the horrible way she met Justinian. She was still his slave, but through their psychic link, she could tell he did not see her as a slave. He treated her as his right hand and like a friend who was also his lover. She looked out at her city and could not wait to see the change Justinian could cause. I want to see it. Following the meeting with President Buren, Justinian began to prepare everything. His laborers had continuously melted down the ore by the tons. That was stored away or used to make weapons and other items. The barrier was still up, but the city and the fortress that was being built were also coming along. Justinian had continued his study into the art of magic and psychic powers and got into runes or enchanting. He and his shapers constructed a gateway on the surface that would lead to Earth. For now, it would open at the same spot in front of the White House until they agreed to move it. Once the gate was created, his shapers could activate it by powering the enchantment with their psychic energy. Once his lab was up and running, he could use magic, psychic, and scientific processes to create mana crystals or anything else as he was the only source of magic in the city for now. For the moment, the gate was opened once more and trade with America began. As Justinian had agreed, he sold both processed and rare ore for American dollars, mostly aluminum, nickel, and zinc. This netted him hundreds of millions of dollars. Americans treated him as a business partner as this was straight from Mars and more was always better. Though he did charge almost double as his dragonflame forged metals were worth more. Even if they were not enchanted and no longer held magic, just the dragon fire had changed them to the atomic structure. While his money rose, it quickly fell as he didn't need to store huge amounts of it. He sent white Martians on a buying spree. They bought microchips, computers, phones, radios, gaming consoles, printers, and even science supplies, all of which he was taking apart to better familiarize himself with them, even though he already did. Batman, though, was keeping an eye on this, as massive amounts of technology were being bought from not just Wayne Tech, but Queen Industries, Stag Industries, and LexCorp as well. Bruce constantly watched as the gate that was constructed kept sending more materials out and technology in. It was hundreds of millions of dollars of advanced technology. His satellites showed all of it was taken underground, and he had no clue what kind of advanced tech Justinian was making. He was so right as Justinian planned to mix technology with magic and psychic powers. The bat computer would not hold a candle to what he was cooking up. Chapter 17. Bruce Rising Paranoia and SciTech. Quick question to those who are more knowledgeable on the Endless. The Emperor of Mankind made it so his custodies could not dream. Even the little time they sleep, they physically cannot dream unless the Emperor communicates with them through dreams. If Justinian fell asleep, would he show up in the dreaming or not? Bruce Wayne was currently once again sitting in the Batcave, feeling a rising sense of unease the more he watched the satellite feed over Mars. It had been almost a month since Justinian had come to Earth and met with the President. Since then, white Martians had been sent on massive buying sprees of technology. They bought things as simple as washing machines to things as complex as demilitarized aircraft. Currently, he was constantly watching the portal where hundreds of millions of dollars of technology complex and simple came through by the truckload. Bruce pressed a button to check on the satellite feed over Mars. Now, six weeks after construction started, the quantity of white Martians working on the build was off the chart. There were thousands of them involved in the project, and it was starting to shape up. He could see hundreds of tons moved by the day as the strength and psychic power of the Martians made heavy machinery needed. What would take a crane could be done by a few workers by hand. It was almost unfair, but that was not what was bothering him. 
it was only a matter of time before the underground staircase was going to be hidden by the fortress around it. Alfred walked over and placed a tray with some soup on it. Master Bruce, you have spent three nights awake. I recommend eating and taking time to sleep. T can't sleep, Alfred. This entire situation is making me feel uneasy. The sheer amount of technology they are moving underground is astronomical. Just as Alfred was going to speak, someone beat him to it. Why do you care so much, Father? Luther makes a suit to kill Superman almost every Wednesday, and you don't make a fuss. Bruce groaned as he spoke. Damien, Luther isn't from the 41st millennium. Just technology from a few centuries in the future has caused catastrophic damage. Why else would a person from the future be acquiring a bunch of technology he would consider primitive and en masse? Damien looked up from his game console as he thought about it for a few moments. He wants to use the technology available to start making stuff that is up to his standard. Bruce nodded. Exactly. I asked Cyborg to see if he could get into his suit, but he could not even start. The suit is protected by not just magic but psychic powers as well, not to mention all the antivirus programming it has. If what Zatanna told me is true, it is bound to his soul. Bruce began to type away on the back computer as he started a new contingency plan. Contingency plan, custodies. Back on Mars, Justinian had not rested since to him, sleep was just a waste of time. His magic and psychic energy kept him refreshed, and his body did not suffer the effects of no sleep. Matter of fact, he had not slept since he had arrived in D.C., and his mind was still as sharp as ever. He was currently deep underground in the pyramid that acted as his site of the ruling. He disliked it greatly, as despite its size it was not something he liked. However, for the moment he made do with having thousands of workers constantly excavating deeper underground. The heat was dealt with through different magical formations and arrays he had to inscribe to keep airflow and cool air flowing. As such, he quickly built up a large subterranean area that was large enough to not just house his bulk, but also the many piles of technology they kept bringing him. That was where he was currently, since he had received the first shipment he had been here. He and his Martians spared no expense as they continued to sell hundreds of tons of metal ore. Justinian was not worried about running out, as even if Mars ran out, he had thousands of asteroids, gas giant moons, Mercury and Venus to exploit. Wa, tea he was selling now to America was worthless in the large scheme of things. In the end, what he spent would only serve him. He was currently walking around as even when he was human, he had built several gaming PCs for fun. He was already quite familiar with this kind of tech, but it was better to see if his new brain could find flaws. Which of course it did, as he began to rapidly see a flaw where his human mind would have seen nothing wrong. By the end of the very first day, he got his hands on things he had learned everything about how microwaves, washing machines, printers, coffee makers, computers, phones, cars, cars, radios, and even advanced Wayne Tech TVs. He knew everything about them, and on the second day, he began to mess around with circuit boards, motherboards, CPUs, and different circuits as he wanted to make a stronger computer. By the third day, he had built a gaming PC, which he had connected by hacking into Bruce's Wayne Tech satellite in space. It was kind of amusing to Justinian to know that his internet access was because of Bruce, so he once again plugged his helmet into the PC. Didrag and Albionov were there to run the astronomical amounts of data that filled the World Wide Web. While his two dragon partners did that, Justinian began to properly work on his laboratory. It went from having smoothed out Martian stone to being encased in dragon steel. Different magic formations and runes were carved into the metal to keep the location secured and protected. He even set up a small manufacturing station where he could begin to produce his microchips, circuits, and other small things. Of course, to supply his lab with electricity for the moment, he had set up several boilers fueled with dragon fire that never needed to be refueled. Once it was up and running, he could forget about them, as the dragon steel and copper used in it were much more durable than their mundane versions. Justinian even started to produce his circuits with dragon copper, which could handle much higher voltage. He even began to experiment in adding magic runes and formations to the circuits, which was tricky at the start. However, he made it work, 
and by the end of the second week, Justinian had completed his first laboratory. The next two weeks were spent with him experimenting, tinkering, and mixing different technologies he bought and made. Now at the end of the month, Justinian looked across the giant lab, which now had a few people. They were mostly shapers whom he was teaching through the psychic net to work with machines. He was sitting at a giant computer made up to his size. It was like the bat computer in a way, but since he used magic in its construction, it would run programs that mundane programming could not do. As for the shapers, he wanted them to set up different factories to mass-produce technology on Mars. If Mars was going to become a forge world, the Martians had to learn themselves. He could not do everything everything, so he would have to elect a fabricator general in the future. Once his planet was terraformed, compliant, and unified, he could begin his great crusade to take over the Milky Way galaxy. He didn't care about the rest of the universe really as all he cared about was his home galaxy. To do that, he would need to produce his own super soldiers, and he already had part of the puzzle. If I can turn white Martians into burning Martians, I will have one of the best forces to do the job. Just as he was in thought, Remnosh, who was sitting next to him, watched as he typed away into it. He still had hacked into Wayne Tech's satellite, and Bruce was none the wiser. For all his intellect, Bruce could not compete with a custodes when it came to intelligence much less one like Justinian, who had psychic and magic to help him in his work. She then turned to the manufacturing station where she saw different components being put together by the robotic arms. He was not even looking at it as his mind was always, what are you making? A bolter. Through their psychic link, he sent her what a bolter was, and she nodded. In Terresting, they were used in your time. Yes, they were mostly used by space marines, but there were variants for the common human. What I am making is more up to par with Space Marine bolters. It could make the soldiers effective at range and up close. Remnosh thought about it as she looked at the gun quickly forming. Can the bolts pierce Martian skin? We are quite durable. He smiled as he turned to her, as if he had programmed everything already. Want to test it out? She recoiled as he meant with her flesh. She looked at his left gauntlet where his Lastrum Storm Bolter was placed. No, not at all. He shook his head and walked over as the bolter was complete. He picked it up into his hands and looked down the site. Shapers began to gather around him as these Martians were full of curiosity. They liked their work and learning about technology was also fun. One of them, a rather old shaper, for a Martian, stood at his left. Though despite his age he did not look it since Martians were extremely long-lived. What have you made, my lord? He handed the bolter to the Martian who looked at the weapon. It's a bolter from my time, a weapon that can pierce most forms of defense if armed properly. Which reminds me, how goes the experimentation with Cymagic alloys? The Shaper placed the bolter down and answered. We have seen progress, Lord. Using the computers you gave to us, we have been looking through human alloys and how they work. We even tested other alternative metals, which brings us to our finding. However, my son would be better able to explain this. Zenez, explain your findings. Justinian and the other shapers turned to the Martian in question, who was on the younger side at 87 years old. Zenez cleared his voice, as all Martians were shapeshifted to appear human in the city. My lord, I began to mix different metals to produce alloys. High carbon steel, stainless steel, aluminum alloys, tungsten, and steel. Bronze, and so many more. What I found was that as we all know, Dragonfire's magical properties changes the material at its atomic structure. That is why Dragonsteel is so much more durable and easier to turn into a Psi-Magic weapon than the old ways we used to. When Dragonfire was used in the production of alloys, it strengthened the positive and removed the negative side. Like this. Zinez ran off to another station and he brought over two ingots. One was pitch black and the other was a light silver. We haven't named them, but these are what we made. The recipe involves steel, chromium, titanium, tungsten, and several more metals and minerals. Normally mixing them like this would not work, but magic breaks the laws that we think are true. The mixture produced the first black alloy, which we found is beyond strong. Justinian picked up the black ingot and grabbed onto it on both sides. 
He slowly tried to break it as he increased the strength needed to do so. When the ingot finally snapped in half, he had to put in a small amount of effort, as he was unfairly strong. You did record the recipe, right? Zanez nodded as he looked at the broken ingots. Of course, we recorded everything, just as you told us. Good, I want you to begin to produce more of this and experiment with it. Use it in Cymagic weapons, use it in armor, use whatever you need to do, and find its value. Compare it to dragon steel and show me the results. Before you do, tell me about the second alloy. We tried to make the metal in your armor, my lord. You called it Oramite, but we could not figure out what metals to use, so we used precious metals. Gold, silver, platinum, and a few more to produce this. We found that while it is quite strong, it doesn't even compare to dragon steel, though it does do this. Zenez picked it up and surged some of his psychic energy into it, causing the metal to glow. Two is super conductive for psychic energy and magic, we think. You are our only mage, so we couldn't test that out. Justinian hummed, as he was curious about this now. Interesting. Keep up your work. He walked away, from them to sit back down at his computer. He began to type away again, as he wanted a way to make adamantium, oramite, beskar, and other metals that were better than mundane steel. Unless he could find Thanagar and get the nth metal they used. For now, he was stuck with the drawing board. Now with actual technology, it made things far easier. Chapter 18 the Unification Wars begins. When Justinian bought technology from Wayne Industries, he made sure to check it for bugs and viruses. There were several as Bruce had wanted to see what Justinian was up to. He failed, of course, but it made Justinian want to cook up a Venus Temple virus to fuck with Wayne Enterprise, but he held off for the time being. Rather than messing with Bruce, he spent all his time in training, research, and inventing. Now that he had an operational laboratory, his research speed was quick. It didn't matter what he was researching, as he had an advantage normal humans didn't have. Simply by being a custodes, he had a brain that could process ungodly amounts of information in milliseconds. A regular space marine had a brain that was compared to a supercomputer. Just the Astartes were works of art, and their intellect was without question. However, they were mass-produced weapons, while the Legio Custodes were individual works of art. The Emperor had used Dark Age of Technology genetic engineering and his own Psyker biomacy to produce every single one. His genetic material was fused into each custode's, and a spark of his power was fused with each custode's soul. It was how the custode's were not just the greatest warriors, but scholars, architects, and philosophers. Justinian was no exception, and he was even greater than even the greatest custodes, Constantin Valdor. He had magic and psyker abilities making his brain even more advanced. The complexity and size of the calculations he could run with his mind meant that even Batman and Luther could only reach a small fraction of his intellect. Plus, he could link his soul to his computer to his helmet, which was a very useful ability. There, Didrag, Albion, and Justinian could spend days at a time with millions of terabytes worth of data flowing between them. All the while Justinian was manufacturing new technology of the 41st millennium. To increase his information, Diedrag and Albion shared the knowledge they had of their past hosts. This gave Justinian far more knowledge of magic than before. From alchemy, enchanting, runes, glyphs, and even more powerful types of magic from their world. Darkness magic, space magic, time magic, dimensional magic, and so much more. Using all this information, Justinian began a massive industrial revolution. The first thing he worked on was a plasma reactor used by the Adeptus Mechanicus. They were used to supply power to void ships, hive worlds, and forge worlds used by the Mechanicus. Through a nuclear fusion reaction, Justinian had enough power to fuel his entire city, lab, and more without running out. The reactor had been buffed with runic enchantments and cymagic formations, causing it to be able to run more power without any higher risk. Once he had all the power he needed, he began to place streetlights in New Cadia City. Giving the Martians lights in their homes was useless, since white Martians could see perfectly fine in the dark. That was why they needed very little light, so he only placed a few lights to drive away the darkness in major areas. For the most part, most of the power went to supply Justinian's lab. From there, more and more scientific, psychic, 
magical and psi-magical advancements were cooked up. Once his shapers learned what they needed, they began to build massive factories where they could begin mass production of technology on Mars. Since New Cadia City ran on plasma fusion reactor energy, there was zero pollution. The little waste that was produced was disposed of through magical means. Now with proper factories, that meant Justinian no longer needed to buy technology from Earth. He had all he wanted, and his city could be self-reliant now. President Buren was surprised when the gate that Justinian had built was turned off and moved to the new embassy that had been built in D.C. Trade was cut in half, which the president didn't understand. He had gotten used to the trade that was going on, as the metal that was sold was of higher quality than even the best alloys produced through Scylla, Iance alone. He got his answer when a member of Justinian's honor guard came to meet with the president. When the Martian came to the White House, he did so in a new set of Psymagic power armor. The sight of the suit made the president realize why trade had stopped. Justinian had all he needed from them and now could manufacture his own better technology. The Martian had given a quick and direct message to the president. We no longer require technology from Earth. The Martian did not even wait for a response before he returned to the embassy to take the portal to Mars. After that, the rest of the money Justinian still had was spent on other items. Textiles, lumber, food items, lots of seeds, and even animals. When the animals were transported to Mars, they wore enchanted collars that protected them from the Martian atmosphere and temperature. The other main item was water, because most of Mars's stuff water was stuck in the ice caps or underground in small deposits. If Justinian wanted to get oceans on Mars, he would need to start somewhere, and buying massive amounts of water would suffice for the moment. Of course, he would first have to deal with the terrible magnetic field, which was why he had been cooking up a spell for that. He had not cast it yet, as he wanted to get his forces armed for the wars that were going to come up. Through his research and that of his shapers, they had invented a massive Psymagic forge which allowed the production of Psymagical alloys. It forced metals that would not mix to fuse into new metals that didn't exist in nature. The result was a few tried-and-true recipes. They were named adamantium, beskar, transparasteel, mithril, and orichalcum. The recipes were a closely guarded secret and the metal that was produced was used in the production of power armor, new Psymagic Nemesis Force weapons used by his honor guard. Besides metal, they also began the production of ceramics like ceramite and plasteel to be used alongside other armors. Each of Justinian's honor guard received power armor and weapons, even a Primarch would beg to use. The soldiers got lower quality, but still mighty power armor and Psymagic Force weapons. As for the Shapers, Justinian began to teach a few of them the magical arts which took the very talented. These new Martian Psymages were allowed to do their research, which was then given to Justinian to expand his knowledge. This was why Justinian wanted to make a new Imperium to expand his knowledge. If he ever wanted to rise to the sphere of gods, he had to start somewhere. He had to be smart, like John Constantine, and powerful like Trigon. That is why for six months, Justinian's constant progress caused other Martian city-states near them to take notice. Almost a year after he came to this reality, Justinian had not just developed his knowledge, but his strength had jumped to a new extreme. His soul had finished its ascension and evolved into a dragon-worthy soul. His golden custody's soul had not changed all that much, other than causing his magical and psyker abilities to receive a massive jump. Even his soul-bound gear had received an evolution from being housed in a much stronger soul. D. Drag and Albion had received the opposite, and their dragon souls had gone through a small mutation. They had taken power from Justinian's soul, which caused them to gain a spark of gold in their souls. This caused the two heavenly dragons to slowly but surely start growing stronger. It was only a matter of time before they became dragon gods, which would cause the three of them to grow stronger together. At the moment, Justinian underground, as the fortress above ground was still under construction. However, it was going to be complete in a matter of weeks, and then it would be a perfect military complex to set off void ships, which were still in construction. The resources to make a single Emperor-class battleship were massive, 
but it would be worth it to expand into the solar system. Currently, he had his eyes closed as he sat on his crystal throne, which had grown larger by feeding on his psychic and magical energy. The amount of information flowing through his mind at the moment was massive, but comfortable. His honor guard had grown, and now it had an even fifty in it, and they were all surrounding him. Each one was wearing their advanced psi magic power armors, which were covered in runes and glyphs. Small psi magic crystals were placed under the plates of armor, causing the elite strength to increase by five times just in their armor. Images here. As usual, Remnosh was sitting on his lap, but for once she was asleep. She had not had time to sleep in the past weeks as she had been in training. She had undergone several rituals he made to increase her strength, and he had shoved a massive amount of magical knowledge into her mind. He had taken time to teach her how to use psi magic personally, and she had no time to rest. All that had drained her, and she had taken to napping when she got time. This was one of those times, and despite her being in her own power armor, she was light as a feather to him. Even he had taken this chance to take the first nap he had in months. After not sleeping since he arrived in his reality, his sleep was quite deep. However, it was interrupted when one of his soldiers ran up the pyramid in his own power armor. When the Martian reached the top, he fell to his knee and placed his hand on his chest. Image here. My lord, I bring news. Justinian and Remnosh both woke up instantly, and they were not happy. Remnosh especially, as she had not slept in weeks. She sat up and spoke through her vocal distorter. What is your message? Your lord was resting. The soldier kneeled further and spoke. Forgive me, but it is of major importance. Justinian reached down and placed a hand on her shoulder. Through the psychic pillar he knew what this soldier was trying to say, but him saying it in person was just respectful. Speak. My king, the laborers in the western mines were attacked by slavers from another city-state. The soldiers stationed there killed a majority of the slavers but captured their leaders. Justinian snarled as he looked at the soldier. Drag them here to my feet. The soldier used the psychic net to send the order, and in a matter of minutes he saw ten more soldiers in power armor dragging an elite up the pyramid. They had stabbed several enchanted chains through his body, causing the Martian to be at their mercy. When they reached the peak, they tossed the slaver at Justinian's feet. Remnosh got up, and she stepped on the Martian's back, breaking it. The slaver grunted in agony as the chains had been stabbed through his limbs, neck, joints, and even his chest. Her breaking his back added to the agony. Make him look me in the eye. Remnosh grabbed the Martian's head and pulled back to force him to look up. Justinian leaned forward on his throne, causing his golden slitted eyes to glow like two suns. Do you know who I am? Probably not if you attack my servants. Only through Martian tenacity was the elite not dead, but he knew fully well who Justinian was. Ever since he had arrived, Martian warriors from several city-states had fallen to him throughout Mars. Never had he expected to be leading a raid into a city-state taken over by the bane of Martians. You tried to enslave my people, and now I will enslave you. Tell me where do you come from? The former slaver did not speak and closed his eyes. Remnosh raised her left gauntlet and placed her storm bolter on the back of his skull. Speak, or I will blow your brains out. Never, never. Before she fired, Justinian raised his hand. Tav ways to make him talk. She smirked as she got off his back and took some distance. The slaver glared up at Justinian with a confident grin. My people do not break easily outs. Before he got done, Justinian aimed his hand at him and fired a stream of Psyker warp lightning at him. It was gold and purple, and when it struck him, the chains forced through his body caused the agony to start to cook him from within. The slaver's agonized screams were bellowing, but Justinian's hawn, or guard, merely glanced at him like he was a bug. Justinian rested his chin on his left hand as he continued the torture. He stopped after a few moments, as the Martian looked quite crispy. You know this is just a game to me. I could just dive into your soul for the information, but I want to have fun. Tell me, and the pain stops. I might even let your soul pass on if I feel like it. Or I catch it and use it in my research. The slaver looked up at Justinian in horror at the words, but he was too slow. Justinian fired another stream of warp lightning to torture not just his body, 
but his mind as well. The Martian screamed and screamed until the pain was too much. Andoving! I come from Andoving! Justinian stopped the stream and turned to his guard on his right. He had renamed them all and shaped them by hand. Helbrecht. Where is Andoving? The giant elite turned to him and spoke. Twenty-five kilometers to the west, my king. Population of 180,000. They are one of the bigger city-states in this region of Mars. Justinian smiled and leaned back onto his throne. Teed appears we found our first volunteer. Justinian dived into the psychic net and spoke to the people of his city. My subjects, we were attacked by another city-state who wished to enslave my people. I will not take this lying down, prepare for war. They thought they could enslave my people, but it is they who shall be enslaved. Be ready. It was silent, but Justinian could feel the fervor for war coming from the psychic net. From his pet Predacons, to his honor guard, to his 20,000 soldiers, and even more, the war shapers. White Martians loved war, and even a large number of laborers had been armed and conscripted for war. This was going to be a day to be remembered in Martian history when the Unification Wars began. Justinian opened his right hand and his guardian spear appeared in it. He slammed the butt of his spear down as the signal. Preparations for war were beginning, and he knew just how to get the perver going. Lorania, come here. Lord. His honor guard, for the most part, was mostly male because they were normally stronger. Remnosh included the number was only five, and each one had cut off because of their skill or strength. As for Lorania, her psychic power was powerful, and her fervor in battle was extraordinary. She walked from the back of his guards and kneeled at his throne. She looked up at him with eyes that glowed gold much like his own. She had a smile, but behind that smile was pure malice to his foes. Have a job for you. Go down to the city and start recruiting more laborers to join the guard. I know several of them are itching to prove themselves. She smiled and placed her hand on her chest. By your will, my king, I will instill in them the desire to fight in your name, my divine master. Image here. She got up and began to descend the pyramid. Much like who he named her after, she was kind of religious and she had begun to see him as a god. He wasn't a god, not yet at least. We will get there soon. Albion and I are growing stronger alongside you, and it is only a matter of time until take that leap. Or he might become a god before us since he is being worshipped by a few of the Martians. He might as well be a divine being since he is the heir of the emperor who had godlike power. True. How do you feel about your impending ascension, my friend? When you two say soon, is that human soon, or dragon and custode soon? Dragon soon. Custodes soon. That means that it is still decades away. But think of how powerful you are now compared to when you arrived. You unclocked your balance breaker, and your previous limit was 20 boosts. You are starting to reach levels of power that very few heroes can face. He is right. Any hero who fights you has to deal with the fact you can keep doubling your power, and any power you can't contain can be vented through the divine dividing. You can steal their strength and double that, making you a nightmare in a fight. You have unlocked more Psyker abilities and your knowledge of the Maw. Jick Arts has improved. That is true, but why rush? We have time, my friends. He sat back on his throne as he could feel Lorania down in the city giving a massive sermon. He could hear her from back here as she had begun to push for the worship of Justinian in New Cadia City. All worship of the Martian gods was not allowed by her as the true divine had arrived. He smiled as worship was an actual energy that he could use to push himself to the path of godhood. Turns out, Justinian size is of no issue. Through Psyker Biomancy which he is inheriting from the Emperor, he can change his size as he wishes. He can become as tall as a titan or as small as a normal man. Darkseid isn't the only one who can become giant. Chapter 19 War Plans I will ratcon the population of Mars rather than 120 million. I will say it is around 450 million. That seems fair for a slow-growing and breeding alien species on a smaller planet. With just an order, Justinian had effectively ignited the desire for war in New Cadia City. Though at this point it was just Cadia City and the White Martians were all feeling the fervor of going to war once more. To them, Justinian was the greatest master for them because while he did enslave them, he did not take away their rights or joy. 
they could still wage war, they could fight to their heart's content as long as they did so under his rule. With a smile, Justinian looked down at the urbanizing underground city that was Cadia City. The red stone that made up the walls had been reinforced with adamantium, engraved with formations and runes to prevent any cave-ins. They even allow for a much more comfortable atmosphere down here, which sped up the growth of crops. The babies who were born were all treated through science and magic to make sure they were all healthy and strong. It did not matter if they were a laborer or elite, as they all had a job to do and with effort they could change their status. Already besides the 20,000 soldiers were called space marines, and there were another 5,000 laborers who had joined the Imperial Guard. Their title was the Tempestus Scions, as they were armored in carapace armor. From the look of it, Aurelina down below was using both her voice, psychic and magical means to give the word. He could hear her from here. The realm of the divine has been invaded. Outsides tried to take our people as slaves. This is heresy of the highest order, and it must be cleansed in blood. Our lord and master has called for a crusade of conquest. Any who decide to join speak up now. The guard always has need for more volunteers. Come one and all. War will be plenty. Remnosh crossed her arms as she looked down at her fellow elite. When did she become a believer in your divinity? Justinian smiled as it was quite funny. When her patriarch kneeled. To her, I might as well be a god in the flesh. Remenosh turned to him with a raised eyebrow. Her helmet held any crook of her arm. Are you? He shook his head. Not yet at least. That made her smile. Not yet, eh? When will you take that leap? Justinian rose to his feet and held his arms behind his back. To don't know yet, but worship is the key. Every time I receive a prayer, I can feel my power rise ever so slightly. It will take time, but eventually, all of Mars, Terra, the solar system, and the galaxy will be mine. As Justinian looked across the city, he could see a stream of Martians rushing to the recruitment stations. His current population was not going to be enough, so he would need to make sure Andoviting was not exterminated. Slowly he would assimilate them into his rule through purges, better benefits, and harsh punishments. He turned to his right, where another one of his honor guards stood. Sigismund, how many Mastodon heavy tanks do we have, and how many Bane blades? Sigismund answered directly. My king, the shapers in the past six months have created five Mastodons and ten Bane blades. Most of their resources are being spent on the construction of the Invincible Reason Emperor class battleship. The amount of resources dedicated to it is not allowing for the production of more tanks than the few we have. Justinian shook his head as building a single Emperor-class battleship was a nightmare. How are the modifications to the warp drives? Unlike in my time, there is no warp to travel in, so I have modified them to act as massive teleport devices. From the look of it was not good. Sigismund said as such. The warp drives consume a massive amount of energy, so much that it takes two fusion reactors to supply it with the power, another one to supply the thrusters, and a fourth for the ship itself. At the rate the construction is going, it will take at least ten years if the speed does not change. Justinian nodded, as his shah, Purs were using all his schematics and knowledge to build and improve on the design as they went. Massive amounts of adamantium and beskar were needed to form the hull. The few shapers who knew how to use magic were spending hours every day engraving the runes, glyphs, and formations to increase the ship's durability and survivability. As for the wiring, it was all made up of mithril, which was a mixture of silver, copper, and gold, and forged in a cymagic forge. It was both very conducive to mana and energy, on top of being extremely resilient. That was then coated in plasteel, which was a dark age of technology creation. It was a plastic that had the tensile strength of steel. As for the windows, they were being formed of enchanted transparisteel rather than glass, which meant that the entire ship needed an astronomical amount of resources and time to build. Then the weapons, along with some special weapons, not from 40k. To pilot it, he had been working to create a sentient AI help manage its systems like Dark Age of Technology ships. When his ship was ready, he would be ready to lead his crusading armies through the galaxy to begin to take planets for his Imperium. Of course, 
when the solar system was completely compliant and his future super soldiers were ready. He grinned to himself as he could barely keep himself relaxed. He was not strong enough yet, he would not be satisfied until even Darkseid would be just a smear at the end of his boot. Until then, he would keep training, improving, learning, and growing. Preparations for the war took around two weeks to not impede current projects. Through her sermons, Aurelina managed to recruit another 5,000 laborers to join the Imperial Guard. That meant that Justinian's forces, not counting his honor guard or warshapers, numbered 30,000. The warshapers were more limited, as they numbered only 2,000. Out of them, only 250 had learned magic, and even fewer could use psi magic. When they were not in war, they were researching technology and further studying the magical arts. As for the 20,000 space marines, they were split into 20 chapters, much like their namesake. Each chapter was not yet named, and they had not been differentiated. Their armor was all the same, and the weapons they used as well. That would change in the coming years, but for now, unity was preferred. As for the laborers, they were also separated into ten battalions that were to move alongside the space marines. The marines were juggernauts expected to get in close, which was why they were armed with Cymagic power armor, bolters, and Cymagic focus weapons. As for the guard, they were in weaker carapace armor made of ceramite and beskar. They would fight up close, but with hotshot plasma guns, and if needed, with plasma swords. Then, Justinian's pet Predacons were effectively living siege engines, and they had been growing stronger this entire time. When the two weeks ended, and Justinian had drawn everything from the slaver's mind, he had sealed his soul inside away in a diamond for future study. At the current moment, Justinian was in his pyramid meeting with his twenty chapter masters, who were in charge of the twenty chapters. They were sitting around a large computer projecting maps of the surroundings to plan the war effort. Justinian sat surrounded by his honor guard while his chapter masters spoke. Each of the Martians who made up the soldiers averaged around ten feet, so every room had to be built up to scale, which made space a small issue. They all wore their black suits of power armor, which hummed with energy. The runes and glyphs covering the armor surged with magic from the crystals embedded underneath the armor, making him happy of his improvements on the Space Marine power armor. Their helmets were removed and placed around the table as they spoke. The first chapter master pointed at the location of Andoving on the hologram. My lord, as you know, the city-state of Andoving is considered the main ruling power in this area. Before the former patriarch and his forces attacked you, we were the only city-state, e who could stand up to them. They probably assumed that after the slaughter we were weak, and they did not know that you have made us stronger instead. Justinian stood up as he looked at the maps of the area. If Andoving is the strongest in this area, how many more are around? Remnosh answered that. Besides Cadia City and Andoving, there are three more city-states. They are small with populations averaging around 50,000. Each one pays tributes to Andoving of resources and slaves in exchange for not being destroyed. However, Andoving is a vassal of the ruling kingdom in this region of Mars. The Tidavia Kingdom, they are a true kingdom with a population of 5 million. Since those are Martians, they are truly powerful as the total Martian population grows very slowly. In reality, it shrinks more than it grows since the city-states, kingdoms, and empires are always warring with each other. The main rival of Tidavia is the Olavalon Empire, which has around the same population as Tidavia. Plus, it is a known fact that the kingdoms have access to better technology than the city-states. They rule over the major ore deposits and resources. Another chapter master walked forward and zoomed the projected map closer. My king, I suggest we leave Andoving as it is for now. Instead, I say we move our focus to these three city-states. Their populations are small, but through magic rituals, each soldier like me could match regular elites, and we are well equipped with our power armor and psi magic focus weapons. We should take the population of these city-states and use them to bolster our numbers before moving against Andoving, since that will set off the kingdom of Tidavia. We can take them now, I would say, but it will give us time to assimilate the populations of three city-states and to expand Cadia City. 
Justinian considered his words before accepting them. Agreed. Andoving is 25 kilometers to the west, yes? I want the exact locations of these three city-states. Another chapter master clicked a few areas on the projected map to mark them. Here, here, and here. Andoving is the closest to us, but these three city-states are all within a 70-kilometer distance from us, mostly to the north and northwest, meaning if we move fast and use bounded fields, they will have to fight us on our terms. We take control of their ruling families, take their psychic pillar, and add it to your crystal throne, and the rest of the population will fall into place. Of course, there will be those who will not submit, and they will have to be purged, but that is a loss we have to take. The rest of the chapter masters all nodded, as that seemed fair. Justinian also agreed with this, as conquests were brutal for a reason. All right, get laborers and war shapers to begin to clear the way to allow the Mastaton and Baneblade tanks a clear path. They are powerful war machines, but they require space to move. The same goes for my Predacons, but they are just as deadly on the ground as they are in the sky. Remnosh brought up a big issue. Will we have to pull laborers from the building of the fortress and the invincible reason? Both of those projects are taking a big chunk of laborers on top of those who are working in the factories and the mines. Justinian knew that numbers were an issue at the moment, and only because his subjects were Martians could they use fewer workers than humans. However, it was still an issue, which was why these three city-states had to be compliant. Their numbers would fix so many issues that he currently had. He stood up from his chair and began to give orders. First order of business, I want a war shaper to go to each of those city-states and to seal them in bounded fields. As long as they are trapped, they will have to fight on our time. One of the chapter masters closed his eyes and through the psychic net began to give some orders. Three war shapers who could use magic received the order and they began to prepare to do the job. When he opened his eyes, he turned to Justinian. The war shapers will get it done, soon my king. Justinian nodded as he overlooked the map. He wanted to look at the tunnels and where they would need to build more to allow the use of his heavy artillery tanks. Even his Predacons needed bigger tunnels because they had been growing larger. This was the disadvantage of underground living, you were limited by the tunnel systems. It is a damn good thing we have magic on our side. All right then, once the tunnels are expanded and reinforced, we will move in full force. There are three city-states, so this is how it will be done. Six Space Marine chapters will move against each city-state with three battalions of Tempestus Scions. Take 500 War Shapers per assault. Rampage and Devastator will move to the first city-state with the troops. Grimlock and Grendel shall go to the second. Predaking will be sent to the third, and I want at least five of my honor guard to lead the attacks. These attacks will happen simultaneously, so I will be leading things from afar with my magical and psychic abilities. Any suggestions? From the look of it, his chapter masters all felt the plan was safe. Each space marine or soldier was modified through magical rituals to increase their strength, resilience, and speed, and they were well armed. If Justinian was going to be leading things like he was, the attacks would go well. Once things were agreed upon, Justian grinned. Fight like nightmares. I want zero losses. I still haven't created any soul stones to capture your souls to resurrect you, and I have yet to become a god, so my divine realm is not a thing yet. Until then, do not die. By your will, our king. Justinian was honestly curious about what the Justice League was up to about now. He had not talked to or seen any of them in months. Knowing them, it was more about defending Earth from their recurring villains whom they let live. He would change that once he began to take over in the coming years. Now as custodian, Justinian knew that Dr. Doom and the Emperor were right. Only under a firm leader like them or Justinian could mankind flourish. Otherwise, they would keep squabbling over stupid reasons. They had to be protected from themselves, and he knew that full well now. They would fight him when he started to take them over, and so would the Justice League. By then, his infiltrators would be so engraved that even if his forces lost, he would still win. It is fun to be the mastermind. Vandal Savage is not the only long-lived schemer now. Chapter 20. Justinian's First Magical Engagement 
I still think my Mars Earth joke is still funny. Just as Justinian and his chapter masters discussed further strategies, empires, and kingdoms, they had to worry about the three war shapers teleported to the smaller city-states. They had been chosen because they had shown a true talent for magic, since most Martians could only use weak spells. When the shapers arrived at the cities, they instantly sealed the cities in bounded fields to give Justinian's forces time to expand the tunnels. This would allow the travel of the Mastodon and Baneblade super-heavy tanks. While they were not needed, Justinian wanted to test them out because they were after all prototypes. If they proved to be ineffective, he would replace them with something else. It was also important to allow room for the Predacons, who now all averaged around 100 feet long, 30 meters. Through Cymagic and several teams of shapers, along with heavy mechanized equipment, they could move hundreds of tons of earth each day. The soil and stone that had been cleared was collected and taken to be processed for minerals and metal as materials were always in need. They never had enough because the mines that Justinian controlled would be exhausted before long to construct his 20-mile flagship, 32 kilometers. That was just for a ship not taking into account all the power armor, weapons, and other miscellaneous components. Justinian would need more mines before he exhausted his own. As for the invincible reason, he called it an Emperor-class battleship, but it was without a doubt a Gloriana-class. He had modeled it after the flagship of the Dark Angels Legion, only that he was improving the design with magic and technology not from Warhammer. He had added some Star Wars weapons and he also wanted to replicate a hyperdrive if that was possible. Faster than light travel was possible just that in 40k, warp drives were used. That had to change because he had turned the warp drive into a massive teleport device to move his flagship through massive areas of the galaxy. If the ship is built in time, even for me, 10 years feels long. Dreg had a suggestion. Why not get human workers to increase the numbers? That could work but they all would have to be under contract to forget what they see or do. I will have to figure something out or find a way to speed up the build without affecting the quality of the ship. All that matters is that it works. Justinian returned to his laboratory to continue his research into the magical arts, psyker disciplines, and technology. He just had to wait until the tunnels were expanded enough to give his troops the space they needed to fight without worrying about cramped tunnels. The build was taking a while, as even several Shaper teams needed to not just expand the tunnels, they had to reinforce them so they did not collapse. In the meantime, Justinian and his forces continued to drill and train. When he was not in his lab, Justinian would impart his custodies martial arts to his honor guard and his chapter masters. What he taught in this chapter masters was drilled into the ten companies. At the same time, Justinian was showing them all through the psychic net different combat styles. Custodes were trained through millennia to master every form of combat humanity has created, from hand-to-hand -hand skills, spear techniques, sword arts, and martial arts created during the Dark Age of Technology, even combat forms formed during the 10,000 years of shame. The best part was that Justinian was starting to fully absorb the memories of the four custodes he was named after. Each one had been a veteran of the Webway, Heresy, and more. Through Valdor's memories, he had plenty of knowledge since Valdor was the king in yellow. Valdor, after the Heresy, had cloned an army of blanks, winged space marines, and Grail's warp entities. When Justinian started his genetic experiments, the expertise of Valdor and the Emperor would both serve him well. The preparations, though, were interrupted three weeks later. The Shapers had nearly finished the expanded tunnels, but back on Earth, something was going to force Justinian's hand. In D.C. at the Imperial Embassy, two Space Marines in full power armor were standing at the entrance. The two Martian soldiers were both on the larger side at 11 feet tall, and their armor made them even larger. The many runes, glyphs, and enchanted gems across their suits made them a terrifying sight. The few civilians that passed by went to the other side, to not get on the bad side of the guards. The main reason for that fear was that the people of Earth were still haunted by the White Martian attack five years ago. It was an organized assault by two of the largest empires of Mars. 
They had attacked Earth in an attempt to enslave mankind to their will. When their armies descended on Earth, it had been a brutal conquest. They slaughtered all in their way, and the only reason only 250 million people died worldwide was that even the Legion of Doom aided in the defense. A Martian takeover was not in their best interests, so they formed an uneasy truce with the Justice League, Atlantis, and the armies of Earth. Together they repelled the invasion, and even now, five years later, they were still finding hidden white Martians, as thousands had been abandoned when the two empires retreated. As for the two space marines from Cadia City, they didn't care about the humans, as they were having a conversation about something more important. These two were mates, and their discussion was quite important. Tam telling you, King Justinian and the captain won't mind. Do you really think the captain will just let us leave to have a child? When a war is about to break out? If we ask, they might. We can say that it is to see how young produced by us who have been magically enhanced will be born. The female began to think about it as they had been together for over 170 years. The issue was current troop numbers did not allow for maternity leave. Each space marine had received magical modifications through rituals. They had been equipped with psi-magical weapons and power armor as well. As such, they were property of the king, a.k.a. Justinian. Just as they were going to think about requesting Justinian himself, the sky, which had been bright and sunny, turned blood red. Both Martians held their psi-magic glaives tighter, as that was not a good sign. The male looked through his helmet's feed, which began to give him different readings. Instantly, he realized this was magically caused, as his systems were seeing elevated magic levels in the area. Vess, this was caused by magic. His mate Vess squinted her eyes as she looked at the sky. The glowing red lenses of her helmet began to supply her with information as well. T can feel the magic, Strucker. We both have the same systems. Strucker began to think about what they should do. What do we do? Do we intervene? Vess snorted at the idea. We do the smart thing. She lifted her left gauntlet and opened her palm. She used the Psi Magic Crystal in the gauntlet to cast activate the enchanted gem. As for Justinian, he had been sitting on his crystal throne with Remnosh on his lap as usual. She had her eyes closed with her helmet in her lap. As for him, he had rested his chin on the top of her head, taking the chance to take a rare nap. Though he would soon realize that whenever he decided to sleep, something major would happen. He had his left arm wrapped around her waist, but since they were both in power armor, it was just to make sure she did not fall off. Just then he woke up with a snarl as he had been awoken again. Why can't I just take a ten-minute nap? That also woke up Remnosh since she was psychically linked to him. What is it? Justinian in moments refreshed himself. Vez is calling. She and her mate were stationed at the embassy to protect it. Remnoth yawned as he opened his right hand and projected the image of the two space marines. Remnosh and he both looked at Vez who was calling. They did wonder why she was calling. Vess did not delay and explained it. My king, I felt you should know, but there is a magical disruption over DC. While the embassy is magically warded, it could get dangerous for the city itself. What are your orders? Justinian squinted his eyes as magic was never good when it came to DC. Remnosh turned her head to look at him. Earth is your home, right? What do you want to do? Before he decided anything, he needed more information. Vess, tell me what is happening and who or what is causing the disturbance. Vess closed her eyes and through the psi magic amplifier arrays in her helmet, she felt her psychic ability be greatly enhanced. Using that, she spread her senses through DC and found the cause quickly enough. High in the sky overlooking the city was a young boy in a black suit with what appeared to be two black horns on his head. On his shoulder was a small tabby cat with red eyes. Vess did not need to say more as Justinian knew who that was instantly. Clarion. Ha ha ha! The Age of Chaos has returned. Come on, Nabu, you old fart. Put them up. Clarion the witch boy is here for keeps this time. Vez looked at the projection of Justinian as he had heard that. Some suited brat with a cat. Do you know who that is, my king? Justinian nodded with squinted eyes. He is called Clarion the witch boy a lord of chaos, meaning he is a very powerful individual. Just as Justinian said that, 
Clarion opened his palms and he started to carpet bomb the city with dark red blasts of chaos magic. The explosions were powerful and each one had the force of several ballistic missiles. They exploded in the streets, toppled buildings, and even began to leave a dark red glow behind. Clarion even aimed his hands at the White House and launched a massive orb of chaos magic at it. Before the White House was struck, a powerful force field enveloped it, stopping the blast. Clarion, not satisfied, began to spin around, launching blasts all over the city. Remnosh waited for Justinian to make the call. He only took a few instants to decide what to do. In the end, he did need to test himself eventually. During Clarion's rampage, he a chaos magic blast at Justinian's embassy. At that moment, it really became Justinian's problem. We are going. Without even standing up, he teleported himself and his honor guard in front of Vess and Stracker. Remnos jumped out of his arms and put her helmet on as Justinian walked forward. As a burning reddish-black orb of chaos magic hurled toward him, he held his left hand out, reflect. In front of his hand, a shimmering gold, purple, and blue barrier absorbed the chaos magic. T think this is yours. He instantly boosted 12 times, causing his strength to increase to 4,096 times itself. He was strong without it, but when he used it, he became a different beast altogether. He aimed his open hand and launched back the chaos magic at Clarion, 4,096 times stronger. He also infused it with his psychic energy and mana, causing it to be a triple-colored orb. It went from pure chaos magic into a gold, purple, and red spurling comet. That took the full attention of the Lord of Chaos. He turned around not expecting his attack to return to him and far stronger than he released. What the hell? The massive blast of amplified chaos, psychic, and Justinian's magic hurled right at Clarion. On instinct, he kicked the orb launching it high into the sky. Everyone watched it fly off into the void of space before exploding in a massive Nova-like explosion. Clarion wiped his forehead with his sleeve. Phew, that was close, right, Tickle? His familiar responded with a single meow. Meow. With a tick mark appearing on Clarion's head, he retorted against his familiar. T did not get scared, you cat. Justinian snorted as he turned to his honor guard who were looking up at Clarion. T will handle this. I want you to start putting out the fires and get ready to face the chaos beasts that are sure to form. By your will. As his honor guard prepared to move, he turned to Remnosh. Be careful. She smiled behind her helmet. Got it. Ves, Stra, Kerr, his honor guard, and Remnosh all began to split into teams because chaos was by its name chaotic. The more chaos magic was released into an area, the more people would die from it. In reality, those deaths meant little to Justinian, and he did not suddenly become heroic. He was not here to protect DC. He was here to protect Terra because it was his true home. Now to show why it is mine. He flew into the sky through his magic. He still had the divine dividing emerge from his back, but he didn't require it to fly. He blasted into the sky and quickly he reached Clarion. The witch boy looked him up and down as he had never seen Justinian before. Ooh, a new player. Never seen you before. You wear black and purple, so you, why are you helping people? Make it make sense, you edgelord. His demon cat, Tikal, hissed at Justinian from Clarion's shoulder. Hiss. Justinian did not speak as he strengthened the grip on his guardian spear. What? Cat got why? Boost. Now 8,192 times stronger, Justinian rushed forward without a doubt several times faster than light. He activated the matter disruption field of his guardian spear while surging his mana and psychic energy into the blade. He even coated it in Albion's Reduce Venom and Drake's Everlasting Flames. Both deadly elements merged into a terrifying flame that never stopped burning destroyed organic matter, burned and erased souls. Clarion's eyes went wide open as he dodged Justinian's upward swing. In that swing, Justinian launched a massive purple-gold slash into space. He cleaved the sky open and even space began to buckle and scream. Clarion didn't look up at the sky as he now saw Justinian as a proper foe and not a toy to torment. With a creepy smirk, he popped his knuckles. This is going to be fun. Justinian took a deep breath as he knew he could not afford to hold back. Drag, Albion, you ready? Yes, we are. Let us show this little shit the might of the Dracone's custodies. Inside Justinian's soulscape, Drag and Albion flanked his golden burning soul. His soul was still as gold as it had ever been. 
If anything, it glowed an even brighter gold after it had taken the qualitative leap into a dragon soul. The perfect fusion of a custodes and dragon soul. As for Drag and Albion, they both appeared to have changed. De Drag had a few sparse golden scales, and Albion had formed a few golden feathers. As one, the three of them synchronized their souls and spoke at the same time. Balance Breaker. Balance Breaker. Clarion squinted his eyes because avatars of Drake and Albion formed at Justinian's sides. The two dragons roared at him before they surged back into Justinian's body. With the roar of a dragon, Justinian released a titanic wave of dragon aura and psychic energy from his body. Clarion closed his eyes as he moved his arm in front of his eyes because of the pressure. What the? The pressure Justinian released for a short moment even made Clarion worry. Every magic user on the planet turned their heads because Justinian had just shown one of his trump cards showing his magical supremacy. Magic was a rare skill, and the magic he used was foreign and easier to use than the native magic of DC. If he was overestimating Clarion, so be it. But if he wasn't, it would be good to use his all. His Oromite Shadowstalker power armor began to warp as the Divine Dividing spread out into three sets of mechanized black Oromite wings. The plates of Oromite expanded as Justinian began to grow larger. From his body, a massive golden-purple aura began to radiate like an ocean from him. The transformation of his power armor was nearly instant, but already he Justinian was now thirty feet tall. In this state, Justinian had full access to the principles of domination and supremacy from his two companions. As for his guardian spear, it had changed into a massive black sword that appeared to have giant segments in it. His transformation was completed in mere instants. Before he activated his balance breaker, he was already larger than Clario. N. Now, he might as well have made Clarion look like a bug. Show me your strength, Chaos Lord. He gripped the handle of his sword and swung it, causing the segments to expand. Clarion's eyes went wide open as he realized that Justinian was more than a challenger. He was a threat. Any ideas for the balance breaker's name? Names are not my strong suit.